Welcome to Westpac's webinar on product and package vibration testing. I'm Greg Swinghammer. I'll be your moderator and webinar organizer today. Before we get started, let's take a moment to ensure that everyone is ready and familiar with the webinar control panel. First, you should have a control panel on the right side of your screen. You may minimize this panel by clicking on the orange arrow button in the upper left-hand corner. You may expand the panel by clicking on the same button. Secondly, you have the ability to submit questions using the chat pane located near the bottom of the control panel. We will be answering a few questions during the webinar. However, if we are unable to address your questions during the webinar, one of our presenters will follow up with you via email afterwards. Today's webinar and video slide deck should be available on Westpac's website tomorrow. With that, let's get started. Today's presenter is Herb Schoenemann, founder and chairman of the board of Westpac. Herb, take it away. Hello and welcome. The uh, information shared here is uh, perhaps the most uh, important portion of the uh, product related dynamics, as I call it. Uh, understanding and applying some of these concepts will result in a far better and more efficient approach to safe product delivery, uh, optimized package design, and effective supply chain management. It's important to start with vibration concepts even if more problems result from shock or impact related events. Understanding vibration dynamics will lead to a better understanding of shock, uh, given that shock pulses are simply a half cycle of a vibration event. Thus, shock is a subset of vibration and not the other way around. Our intention here is to investigate when and why and how we do mechanical testing of products and package systems. Uh, related to that, we'd like to know uh, what we can learn from this exercise and specifically what in the world we do with the information uh, that once we get it. In other words, how can we make the world a better place by using this information? Our agenda for this rather ambitious endeavor is as follows. Uh, we will look into the background and terminology utilized in dynamic testing. The reason for this is that every profession has its own lingo, and the lingo winds up being half of the battle in understanding what to do in that particular area. Uh, we will then dive into vibration dynamics in a big way. Uh, we'll study spring mass systems and all the background information we need uh, for these models for understanding them. Uh, we will cover different types of uh, excitation by which spring mass systems get moving. Uh, we'll dwell on the concept of resonance which I call the silent killer in distribution. Uh, finally, we'll apply some of these this information to the design and testing of uh, package cushion systems. So fasten your seatbelt because this is going to be a fast ride. Moving uh, into the lingo portion, there are two concepts that are very important. The first one is that uh, uh, term of dynamics, which implies that something is moving. Things are they're not static. So dynamics means motion is involved. The other important concept is that of flexibility, namely that there's some ability to expand or compress or bend or do something in response to the dynamic input. This is also important. So to begin with, we revisit our old friend, the spring mass system. The system is a single degree of freedom system in that the mass is somehow constrained to move in one axis only. The mass is uh, uniform and has no flexibility. Spring has no mass, and the uh, damping is uh, so-called critical. We'll explain that a little bit later. Uh, it doesn't matter if the spring mass system is in uh, compression or tensile or shear or flexure or any other spring mode. Uh, the base to which the system is attached is many times more massive than the uh, mass itself. So those are the background criteria that uh, define our uh, idealized single degree of freedom spring mass system. Okay. Here's some more important terminology. Uh, any input applied to the mass in the spring mass system will result in what we call free vibration of the mass. Any input applied to the foundation results in forced vibration to the mass. So this terminology applies to all spring mass systems. So you often will hear those terms free versus forced vibration. Here's a very concise definition of what that means. 
The uh, oscillation of a single degree of freedom spring mass system gives rise to the familiar sinusoidal waveform. Uh, assume a writing instrument, like a pen, for example, is fastened to the mass during this uh, free oscillation. A moving strip of paper uh, by the mass will scribe a sinusoidal function, as shown here. Uh, the time is always on the horizontal axis. In this case, uh, displacement is on the vertical axis. Uh, velocity or acceleration could also be displayed on the vertical axis, uh, but would be out of phase with the displacement by 90 degrees in each case. So this is how a sinusoidal function actually occurs. That's that's where it comes from. It's the oscillation of a, of a spring mass system. As was mentioned earlier, the mode of the spring is not important. The spring mode could be tension or compression or torsion or shear or flexure or any other mode by which a spring uh, changes its, its dimensions. By the way, this also applies to uh, two degree of freedom systems as shown in the lower figures on this particular slide. Also shown is the fact that uh, a tensile model spring mass system is nothing more than an inverted compression model. Uh, they function identically the same way. Okay. Another interesting feature of our spring mass system is the fact that we can actually calculate the natural frequency, which is the frequency at which the free vibration occurs, uh, knowing nothing more than the static deflection of the system. That is to say, if, if we were able to measure the length of the spring before the mass is placed on it, and then again measure it, uh, the length of the spring after the mass is placed on it, we can determine the natural frequency of the system from that number alone and using the, the shown formula. In many instances, it's uh, impractical or nearly impossible to measure this deflection accurately enough uh, for uh, formula purposes. It does, however, give a good indication of the natural frequency of a spring mass system without any uh, testing whatsoever. We just need to know the deflection uh, very precisely. As was noted earlier, free vibration occurs when the uh, uh, excitation is centered on the mass itself. The oscillation is referred to as the natural frequency of this particular spring mass system. When excited on the base, the uh, force vibration results. And uh, when the forcing frequency is applied, uh, applied to the base is equal to the natural frequency of the spring mass system, the system is said to be in resonance. Um, the phenomenon of resonance is uh, critically important to us because non-resonant vibration response, in other words, vibration response not at the natural frequency of the spring mass system, is generally benign uh, because of the low amplitude, low peak levels, if you will, low G levels, you can think of it that way. Uh, it's only when a critical component is forced at its natural frequency that vibration of, of damage is likely to occur. Uh, fatigue and ultimate failure of uh, critical components occurs primarily during resonant frequency vibration. So that's why I call resonance the uh, silent killer uh, in uh, vibration testing and certainly in, in transit because that's where most vibration occurs anyway. Okay, a little, little more background stuff. I hope you're hanging in there with us. Now, some people ask why we use a single degree of freedom spring mass systems when they don't really represent the kind of products that we test during normal vibration analysis. The real world consists of multiple degree of freedom spring mass systems and in, in almost anything that we're likely to test. And the answer to this is that uh, multiple degree of freedom systems, so-called MDOFs, get very complex very quickly, and the analysis would be overwhelming, to say the least, especially in the learning process. So it's much easier to uh, uh, conceptualize a single degree of freedom spring mass system and then simply to uh, learn the complexities that result when the system becomes more complex, such as a multiple degree of freedom system seen here. It's also important to recognize that our friend, the spring mass system, is assumed 
to contain a linear spring. Hmm. Linear springs are ones that have a uniform or linear relationship between the deflection and the force. Not all springs are that way. In fact, most springs are linear only over a very short distance. It may be helpful to review what is meant by a linear spring. Uh, again, a linear spring is one that has a uniform or linear relationship between the force and deflection. Note that the force and deflection do not have to be equal. It's only necessary that the linear relationship exists between the two. So if you increase the force by X amount, then you increase the uh, deflection uh, by the same amount for each incremental increase in force. In other words, that relationship is linear. There are other types of springs, and as you might guess, there's one that, that gets harder. It's called, surprisingly enough, a hardening spring, nonlinear. And the spring uh, whose force increases as the deflection increases is referred to as a hardening spring. Uh, most common mechanical springs display this characteristic, uh, especially near the end of their deflection range. Conversely, a spring that requires less force as deflection increases is referred to as a softening spring. Uh, there are very few springs that function this way in the real world, but it's a good theoretical model nonetheless. As was mentioned earlier, our study of single degree of freedom spring mass systems, SDOFs, assumes that the springs are linear. Most uh, flexibility of springs, spring systems, in the real world involves nonlinear spring dynamics, especially for the greater deflection ranges. We get away with uh, using linear spring dynamics because all springs can be analyzed as linear or near linear in a certain portion of their deflection range. This makes our analysis and especially our equations much easier to handle. In addition, the difference between a linear spring and, a, and most mechanical springs uh, in the center portion of the deflection is very minimal. In other words, it's a good approximation. Another interesting phenomenon of uh, spring mass systems is referred to as coupling. Uh, in this diagram, the center of the gravity of the uh, mass is assumed to be point A. The response to a force applied at F1 is pure vertical motion of the mass. And you can see that. And likewise, a force applied at F3 results in pure horizontal motion of the mass. And then a rotational force applied at F2 results in pure rotational response. So all motion is uncoupled relative to the input. In other words, there's no special response of the mass based on where, it, where it's applied. When the center of gravity is moved to point B, a force applied at F3 will still result in pure horizontal motion of the, uh, of the mass. Uh, however, a force applied at point F1 will result in a rotational response of the mass. The response to a force at F1 is said to be coupled to the input, while the response to F3 is said to be uncoupled. So also a rotational force at F2 likewise produces a coupled uh, rotational response of the mass. It's all due to the fact that the mass is now unbalanced in those two orientations. Okay, we have reached the point where you probably are sick and tired of hearing all of these pieces of background information, and you might have some questions about all this kind of stuff. So, Greg, are there any, uh, any questions indicated from our audience at this point? Um, Herb, we don't have any questions right now, but do you have anything else you'd like to add to the background information before we continue? Uh, thanks, Greg. I, I certainly do. Uh, in our earlier webinar today, someone asked a, a very good question, and that was, hey, you, you've uh, explained uh, you know, linear or uh, uh, hardening and softening springs. Uh, what's, a, what's a practical example of these things anyway? Um, linear springs are, again, all springs in, a, in a, probably the center portion of their uh, com compression range tend to be linear, 
at least for a, a small degree of their uh, compression. Um, a hardening spring is uh, your springs in your automobile are typically hardening springs. They uh, they tend to get harder the more you move away from them. Um, almost all cushion systems are hardening springs, uh, at least those uh, consisting of uh, polymeric foams, uh, but not all of them. There are some uh, that uh, actually uh, are softening springs, and, and those are things like a, a thermoformed polymer sheet, for example, uh, that, that are sometimes used as a corner pads or end caps or those kind of designs of cushion can be, in fact, uh, softening springs. Also, there's a product uh, that some of you may recognize, uh, honeycombed uh, paper material that's sometimes uh, used as a heavy-duty cushion. Once you actually start compressing it, it compresses easier uh, as you move along, and, and thus it's a softening spring. Uh, again, there are not too many of those around for practical applications. Most of the cushions we use uh, are, in fact, uh, hardening springs. The more you push them, the more force it requires to push them. Uh, Greg, back to you. Thanks, Herb. Um, just a reminder, everybody, please send in the questions. If you have any that pop in your head as we go along, we'll try and get to them uh, at our next question break. If we don't have time to follow up with you during the webinar, uh, Herb or myself or someone else from Westpac will follow up with you after the webinar. But please send in the questions. They're always fun and interesting. Herb, back to you. Very good. Thank you, Greg. It was mentioned before, and it's worth repeating, that resonance occurs when a compound or a component, rather, or system is forced to vibrate at its natural frequency. This condition represents the maximum response of a spring mass system to any vibratory input. This is exactly where damage is most likely to occur in the form of fatigue or scuffing or something similar. I often refer to, refer to resonance as the silent killer in uh, dynamics. A spring mass system can be instrumented uh, by putting a response accelerometer, I'm sorry, an input accelerometer uh, on the foundation here and a response accelerometer on the mass right here. Okay. The system uh, is then forced to vibrate and the ratio of the response to the input acceleration is plotted as a function of frequency. And then this transmissibility plot shown here will result. The plot shows that at low frequencies, in this region down here, the response and input are identical, resulting in a ratio of 1. As the frequency increases here, the response becomes greater than the input and the ratio reaches a maximum at the natural or resonant frequency of the system. As the frequency continues to increase, the response accelerometer will diminish. In other words, it will go below one. The ratio goes below one. Uh, and uh, th this results in attenuation. The maximum acceleration of the system is referred to as a Q, and it's a measure of the uh, damping built into the system. The Q value is shown here. The test is conducted by fastening the test specimen to the table of a suitable vibration test machine. The flexible components within the product are monitored uh, with the response accelerometers, just as we saw. The vibration table is set to vibrate in a sinusoidal or random vibration mode, typically. Uh, during this input, the response slash input ratio of each monitored component is plotted as a function of frequency. This will result in a transmissibility plot for each of the monitored components, as was shown on the previous slide. This test may be conducted using any type of uh, vibration excitation equipment, including electrodynamic shakers, electrohydraulic, or even acoustical sound chambers. Uh, getting back to the, uh, the, the type of excitation, some people think that only a certain type of excitation is suitable for determining resonance in a spring mass system. Well, the truth is that all spring mass systems will respond at their natural frequency to any excitation source. And the reason is quite simple. They can't do anything else. Uh, thus, uh, many different types of excitation are suitable uh, for this purpose. Uh, 
I often wondered how they actually tested the space shuttle, for example, before they took off. It was way too heavy to put on a shaker, but they simply hung it in a acoustical chamber and did uh, acoustical emissions testing on it, and it resulted in the same basic uh, information. This table shows a, a reasonably good and brief summary of some of the positives and negatives uh, of different types of excitation often used for resonant frequency purposes. So let's take a look at this. Um, sinusoidal is the first one that I mentioned, and it's positive, it's easy to understand, it gives good visual feedback, and it's uh, grandfathered. We've been using it for a long time. The problems with it are it gives false amplification values because you're only exciting one frequency at a time and you're, you don't excite the, you don't, you don't take into account the um, destructive interferences of two resonances that are close. Um, it results in over testing for fatigue potential, that's for certain. Uh, it doesn't account for, as I mentioned, constructive and destructive interferences between various systems. Random vibration, which is probably where, the, where most of, of uh, us do our testing for vibration, it's quicker. Um, and the reason is that we excite all frequencies at once. We don't have to sweep over the whole frequency bandwidth, if you will. Uh, there's less fatigue potential. Uh, it's more realistic because that's what the real world really is. And sure enough, it matches the real world. And on the not so positive sides, it's more complex, harder to understand. You need a computer controller to do it. Um, and so it's a little more expensive, but certainly much more realistic. And one could question whether it's, it's really more expensive. Given the wide uh, application, it's probably just it's about the same price. Um, acoustical emissions, available heavy systems. I mentioned the space shuttle got uh, tested that way. has very good high frequency response. On the negative side, it's very expensive, and it does require a large uh, acoustical emissions chamber in order to make it work. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about damping. Uh, the function of damping is uh, not specifically covered in depth during this webinar, but we should mention it and make sure that everyone knows exactly what it is. Damping is that resistance to motion that will eventually bring an oscillating system to rest over time. Damping occurs in all spring mass systems. There's no such thing in the real world as a totally undamped system. Dampling is normally described as a ratio between actual damping and so-called critical damping. You've probably heard that term. Critical damping is that damping that allows the spring mass system to return to its uh, neutral position in the shortest amount of time uh, without oscillation after the excitation is removed. Uh, for our purposes, uh, damping directly relates to the uh, amplitude displayed on, by the spring mass systems uh, at resonance. The lightly damped systems tend to have higher amplification factors, what we called Q. And you can see an example of Q on this particular plot in this axis, the amplitude. Think of that as Q. Okay. Um, more uh, highly damped systems tend to have a lower amplification level of resonance. So damping is normally an indication uh, indicated by the, a, a dash pot. And what's a dash pot? It's, it's these things right here on any spring mass system uh, diagram anyway. So it's normally indicated by a dash pot located between the, the mass and uh, the mass and its, its foundation uh, parallel to the spring in the system. So again, uh, lightly damped systems uh, tend to have higher Q values here. And, and as you approach uh, critical damping, where the ratio of the critical damping to actual damping is one, uh, you, you have virtually no oscillation of the mass at all, so you have virtually no amplification. Okay. Uh, this plot shows uh, uh, undamped uh, spring mass response in blue. Okay, so you can see it here, oscillating. Okay, the green line shows damping that is uh, slightly less than critical. So you can see uh, that it. Uh, undershoots here at, at the zero to zero uh, ratio line. Uh, the uh, red plot shows critical damping. So you can see that this oscillation comes to a zero 
in the least amount of time without any overshoot. And then this uh, blue line uh, shows what would be considered uh, over damping. So that, that's basically about all we need to know uh, about damping in dynamic systems. One of the biggest problems occurs as a result of uh, repetitive vibration, and that is uh, fatigue. Uh, the so-called mechanical fatigue is a, a weakening of the material caused by repeated applied loads. The higher the load, the more the fatigue can be anticipated. Fatigue results in localized structural damage, uh, typically where the displacement or flexure is the greatest. Since resonance represents the highest response of a spring mass system to vibration input, fatigue normally occurs at system resonance. The damping uh, is a factor in fatigue buildup as well. And that's exactly why I call uh, resonance the uh, silent killer uh, in vibration. So let's talk a little bit about the sources of vibration. So when, when thinking about this, uh, this testing of products, either for reliability or transportation related purposes, it's important to determine where the vibration actually come from. Where is the source? For most products, the operating environment is relatively benign in terms of vibration. Most inputs coming from you know, rotating devices, such as fans or motors or similar, that are slightly out of balance. Sometimes the influence of nearby structures or equipment will cause some level of vibration input as well. Uh, strong air currents, for example, can cause vibration hazards. Uh, earthquakes represent a special type of vibration hazard that may occur in the operating or the non-operating mode of the uh, unpackaged product. In the uh, non-operating mode, transportation uh, is surely the biggest source of vibration hazard. Um, Unless your customer is next door, you will likely have to ship your product, and in today's global market, that shipment may be substantial. The vehicles on which the product travels are the source of the vibration input, and these inputs are normally many, many times that of the operating environment. Over the years, there have been many different types of vibration testing utilized. The oldest is probably the sinusoidal resonance search and dwell test. Nothing is particularly wrong with this procedure, except that it's a uh, phenomenon of the laboratory only. It never happens in the real field environment. It's still commonly used, but it certainly has its limitations. Random vibration testing, on the other hand, has gained wide popularity during the past uh, decade or more. It's used to, it used to be difficult to generate reliable random vibration spectra, but now it's a relatively simple matter with the advent of computer usage for vibration controllers. A random vibration test protocol has many advantages over other possible test procedures, and we'll talk about those shortly. There are a number of uh, test procedures that are referred to as margin test, uh, which means that the product is tested to the failure level. One of these is referred to as a HALT, so which stands for Highly Accelerated Life Testing, and it's utilized uh, often in product reliability testing. Test procedures uh, can be imposed by third parties, uh, but most of the time these are simply adaptations of existing public domain uh, test procedures. If you are involved in military apparatus testing, you will experience specialized test inputs that have been specifically created to simulate the military environment, which is found to be very uh, different and normally much more severe than commercial products environment. There's a lot of different procedures that are becoming more popular and we would encourage manufacturers to be careful about adopting these vibration test procedures that may seem promising but are probably less likely to be predictive in terms of their results. So caution is advised here. This is a list of common test procedures that we see very often in the laboratory for various purposes including product reliability testing as well as uh, product testing for the distribution environment. Uh, most company spec test specifications are adaptations of these procedures, and uh, the most popular, of course, is the ASTM D3580, which doesn't say too much, but is a very commonly used procedure. The IEC 60068-2-6 and then-47 are uh, also widely utilized. Uh, Federal Standard 101 is a dated standard, but it still has some, some value and is still seen 
the others are, are somewhat less often seen. If you're involved in telecommunications work, uh, you'll be very familiar with the Telcordia uh, GR63 core, which began its life as a Bell system uh, operating test spec. In establishing a vibration plan for your product, it would be most helpful to review the guidelines identified in the typical design of experiment manuals. Very helpful. Uh, clearly, the test plan should cover all anticipated types of environmental inputs, including combined environments, when feasible. Above all, remember that the shipping or distribution environment represents the most severe vibration hazards for most products. When thinking about this, it's important to use the perspective of what we call quality delivered. The implication here is that no one's job in the corporation is done until the client has the product and is satisfied with it. This means that uh, our judgment has to be beyond the end of the production line uh, and extend all the way to the customer's hands. This includes transportation and transportation represents the worst possible vibration environment of the product's life cycle in most cases. So don't ignore vibration uh, from transportation and distribution. It's the killer. It's also important to establish a passing criteria prior to establishing the, uh, the actual test. Uh, there will likely be some unknowns during the test. You don't really know what's going to fail. But anything that can be done to establish a passing or failing criteria prior to test initiation will always be time well spent. There are lots of ways to start the testing once a plan is established. It's almost always a good idea to start small uh, with more familiar hazards such as temperature, for example. Temperature extremes or rapid temperature change, often referred to as thermal shock, uh, is known uh, to be a killer for many types of products uh, due to differential uh, co uh, contraction and expansion. Uh, this can easily be followed with mechanical vibration testing, which is now at the point of economic viability for almost all companies and product types. As a means of moving forward or creating more value, uh, incorporating the combined environments testing mentioned earlier, such as temperature and vibration, for example, can result in, in a very good uh, uh, data and input in a relatively short period of time. There are a variety of other so-called combined environments testing that may make sense depending on the product, the environment through which it travels, or the environment uh, in which it is intended to operate. The slide shows some of the other combinations of environments that might make sense for reliability testing. And you can see that most of those involve uh, uh, temperature and something else, uh, impact, uh, compression, vibration, pressure, uh, that kind of stuff. So uh, don't uh, don't ignore the uh, availability of uh, thermal testing combined with something else. Um, one of the most successful stories uh, involving combined environments testing is that referred to as AGREE. This stands for the Advisory Group on Reliability of Electronic Equipment. It uh, started in the 1950s, late 50s, and AGREE testing um, what was a product of the military and has been responsible for much of the improvement in the reliability of military related hardware over the years. Military type testing normally uh, precedes much of the commercial testing that we do now because of the harsher environment in which the military products find themselves. Sooner or later, however, much of this testing finds its way into the commercial market because of the uh, value the testing adds in improved reliability, uh, more efficient shipping, and a variety of other reasons. Uh, this slide uh, shows uh, what's referred to as an agree chamber, where you have a, a, an agree, a temperature chamber designed to very rapidly vary the temperature, and then a vibration machine buried underneath it, so that just the head shows up inside the chamber, so that you can produce vibration here inside a temperature environment. And that is referred to, again, as agree testing. The final goal of this vibration analysis or testing is a ruggedized product. Uh, not one that's bulletproof, but one that works reliability, reliably rather for uh, 
at least the period of time designated as the product's normal life cycle. During this time, you would want the product to be free of latent defects and able to create a good impression with the client immediately upon receival, the so-called out-of-box experience. Now, the testing is also very useful for making a list of changes that can be made, uh, upgrades, if you will, to the product for increased uh, ruggedness and reliability. This, this kind of testing is also very useful for documentation uh, that a particular customer or specification may require uh, in order to verify that their requirements have been met. Okay. Moving on to the realm of uh, package design and testing, one of the most important functions of the package uh, cushion is to attenuate vibration input during transit uh, at those frequencies where the product is most sensitive. In order to do this, the cushion material is treated as a spring in the uh, dynamic response of that uh, spring must be determined in order to properly design uh, with a particular material. Uh, interestingly, there is not a recognized standard for conducting this kind of testing, but there are lots of guidelines and history readily available. One of the first methods for determining a cushion vibration characteristics utilized a so-called a guided test block. This is a system that has a mass uh, with the uh, cushion above and below it. And the mass was guided so that it was, would respond uh, only in one axis. Uh, the mass of the block could be changed in order to change the static loading on the cushion. And the results of this test were not terrible, but eh, close to it. Uh, several alternative methods have been developed recently that give uh, much better results. Uh, for those applications where a cushion system is used on a floating pallet, typically on a heavier crated system, for example, uh, we use what's referred to as the tension compression model. Uh, this is shown in the diagram on the left-hand side. Uh, the cushion material is loaded with a certain mass, and the system is secured to the table of a vibration test machine and forced to vibrate. Uh, the mass and the cushion are also adhered together. And the response of the mass is then uh, divided by the input acceleration and it's plotted as a function of frequency, creating a transmissibility plot, just like we saw before. For those applications where cushions are used in compression only, and that's probably the vast majority of situations, uh, the compression compression model is used. This is shown on the right-hand portion of the slide. The uh, procedure is identical to that previously described, and a transmissibility plot is the end result. So again, what we see here is the uh, tension compression. So on the up cycle, uh, this cushion is in compression. On the down cycle of the vibration machine, it's in tension. So that's why it's referred to as the tension compression model. Over here, we see the, uh, the the mass with a, a cushion above and below it. So on the down cycle, we find that the uh, upper cushion is in compression. The bottom cushion is not functional. On the up cycle, the bottom cushion is in compression and the top cushion is not uh, functional. So we call this the compression compression model. It's important that these two be identified as different because the cushions are used differently and therefore respond differently. This slide shows a schematic of the test uh, setups on the uh, left-hand side and the actual test block fastened to the table of an electrodynamic vibration machine on the right side. As you can see, the system is quite simple and uh, easily adapted to this kind of testing. Using any of the methods previously described, the uh, spring mass system is excited. Uh, sinusoidally or random vibration, uh, and the response uh, input ratio is then plotted as a function of frequency. This uh, is our results on our familiar uh, transmissibility plot showing the start of amplification, the peak uh, as determined by the um, damping, and then the beginning of attenuation at this particular point at, at that particular frequency. Okay. 
There are three uh, important points uh, to be identified on the transmissibility plot uh, just described. So again, point uh, B here uh, describes the frequency at which the amplification begins to occur. Point uh, A here at the peak describes the uh, point where the natural frequency occurs uh, and the amplification level is uh, maximum. Uh, point C shows where the system begins to attenuate vibration input. In other words, this response input ratio here becomes less than one. This is the point where the cushion system is working effectively to attenuate the vibration input. So this is where we want to design the cushion uh, for our, our package system in this region right here. In order to uh, construct this uh, useful data, the uh, mass is changed and another transmissibility plot is conducted. Okay? This process repeats itself for at least five different changes in the mass of this spring mass system. Uh, this amounts to creating a different loading or weight per unit area on the cushion material itself. Since uh, static loading is the primary tool by which uh, cushion systems are designed in a protective package system. This type of information is exactly what we need in order to design the best possible package system for vibration attenuation. So as you can see, for each of these loadings here, these happen to be in grams per square centimeter, uh, the, the peak is identified here, point A. The beginning of amplification is identified as point B and the beginning of attenuation is identified as point C and those same three points could be identified for each of these loadings uh, resulting in these different transmissibility plots. <clears throat> Once we have at least five static stress loading points and their corresponding transmissibility plots we can transfer that data to the amplification slash attenuation plot shown here um, that shows a frequency on the vertical axis here uh, and static stress or static loading uh, on the horizontal axis. This one happens to be in grams per square centimeter. It could also be in pounds per square inch. Okay. Um, for each transmissibility plot conducted, there is a different, uh, at a different static loading, uh, the uh, A, the B, and the C points are identified. So that would be for one static loading. Uh, then those other three points for the next static loading are identified here and then here and here and so on. And then we simply uh, connect all of the C points, all of the B lines, all the B points and all the A points. And this results in a zone in the center where the spring mass system amplifies vibration input. Remember the A point is at the peak. The B is where it starts and the C is where it ends, it's, it's uh, amplification. And C is where we begin the attenuation zone, so that's exactly what's plotted out here, it's attenuation. So between the uh, B and C lines is the area on this plot, bounded by frequency and static loading, where this cushion material amplifies vibration input. This is very important information for us, and this is exactly what we need for package uh, design purposes for vibration attenuation. And this is how we do it. Uh, a horizontal line uh, is drawn here across this plot, okay, at the lowest natural frequency of the product. The lowest frequency is the most important uh, from a vibration sensitivity point of view uh, because the higher natural frequencies will be addressed by this procedure as well. I'll show you how that's done. Where this horizontal line um, represents the, the lowest natural frequency, intersects the amplification attenuation point right here. Okay, This point defines the lowest static loading here uh, that will give acceptable results for a particular design application. Heavier loadings, out this way, okay, will result in greater attenuation. We go further into this attenuation zone. Okay, So uh, the 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 lighter loadings will cause uh, the spring mass system to actually amplify vibration input in this area. Okay, so you can see how that works. Also, 
the higher natural frequency of the product, let's say you have a product natural frequency at 60 hertz, and you're going to load it at uh, approximately 70 grams per square centimeter, you can see this already in the attenuation zone. So this is why we identify the lowest natural frequency, which gives us the most stringent requirements on the cushion, and that any higher natural frequencies are going to be further into the attenuation zone at that loading, and therefore are properly protected. So that's why we need to identify the lowest natural frequency of the product in any orientation in order to do the vibration attenuation. Okay. Okay. Um, I know that that's a, a lot to absorb for a relatively short period of time, but we're going to uh, pause here now and uh, ask if there are any questions that we can answer or any other uh, inputs that we can offer to help clarify things. Greg, are there any questions? Um, Herb, it doesn't look like we have any questions right now, but if you guys have thought of any of, as we've gone along here, please go ahead and send them in. We have a few more minutes to wrap up. Uh, Herb has some other wrap-up comments he'd like to add. Herb, over to you. Thanks, Greg. Uh, during our earlier webinar session on the same topic this morning, there were some interesting questions that I thought I'd uh, pass the answers along to. Uh, the first one had to do with uh, designing cushion systems especially heavier duty systems that have uh, very low natural frequencies uh, uh, on the uh, transmissibility plot that we saw on, uh, uh, what was it, plot number um, 43, um, it identified the lowest natural frequency, but what happens if we got a, a natural frequency of the product that's so low, it's hard to get below that. For example, larger systems that we've tested show structural resonances uh, sometimes in the neighborhood of 15 to 16 hertz. Uh, the normal procedure is that the uh, natural frequency of the cushion system should be one octave below that, which is basically one half that frequency or about 7 to 8 hertz. And uh, if you try to do that, sometimes you can result in uh, unstable systems that, uh, that are either overloaded or they overheat or a lot of other things go on undesirable. So if that happens, I, I do want to emphasize that it's not always essential to uh, uh, design a cushion system, especially for heavy product, uh, such that you attenuate vibration input all the time. You can actually design it uh, at the other end of the spectrum. In other words, you can design it in the one-to-one -one zone, which basically means you uh, underload the cushion so that uh, the product feels the same amount of vibration uh, as the truck is sending it. Because if you remember the transmissibility plot at the extreme left end, which is what I'm really talking about, um, there's no amplification and no attenuation. We call that a one-to-one -one or couple zone. Sometimes it's a, it's a good idea uh, because you simply can't get into the attenuation zone with the cushion because of product characteristics that you can't change. So. That has been done successfully. It's not the most desirable thing, but it certainly can happen. So don't don't think that just because we say uh, don't uh, you know the, the cushion system has to attenuate that there are, that that happens all the time. Uh, it's certainly desirable, but there are, are some cases that simply force your hand to do something else. Also, if you consider that the uh, uh, amplitude of the acceleration, the vibration acceleration on trucks rarely exceeds 1G. Uh, so the product will not fail because of uh, you know, a, a structural failure or you know, the uh, over overloading uh, of the amplitude. It, uh, it's only when uh, the products get excited at their natural frequencies that you have problems. Now trucks do have natural frequencies that are smack dab in the middle of the 15 or 16 hertz range. Don't, don't get me wrong, that does exist. Uh, but what, what you want to make sure that you don't, uh, uh, what doesn't happen is that you design the cushion system so that it amplifies in that range. Uh, normally products can withstand some level of input um, at, uh, as long as it's not amplified, but suppose you have a, a product with a natural frequency of, of 15 hertz, let's say, and you have a cushion system with a natural frequency of 15 hertz, and you have a truck that amplifies vibration input at 15 hertz. So the truck gives the cushion system X amount of acceleration, okay? The, uh, because it's in resonance, 
at that particular point. The cohesion system amplifies that by five or ten times. That's not unusual. So it takes a half a G input and, and multiplies it by ten times. Now you got five Gs. Okay, and then the product, uh, which also has its fundamental resonance there with an amplification of you know five to ten, will take that five G input and then amplify it again, giving you you know. Uh, 50 G's, up to 50 G's, uh, at 15 times a second. That's where the problem happens. That's where things come apart. 50 G's, 15 times a second, boy, I'd, I'd die too, you know. It just is way too much acceleration level. That's what we have to avoid. These. So the best way to do that is, is that the cushion system attenuates, but that's not always uh, effective. It might not attenuate at some, some point. So I hope that's uh, clear. Um, also, the, uh, in the earlier session, we had uh, some uh, questions about the real the function of damping in in, uh, in cushions, and really why that's important, and and uh, what we can say about it. Uh, again, all spring mass systems have some level of damping built into them, and if we had our choice, well, obviously we'd, we'd prefer that to be critical damping because uh, th that's the easiest to deal with. But not all systems are that way. Um, a, a good uh, example is those of you who design or use a protective uh, package systems or, or, uh, are familiar with them know that uh, the, the uh, polymeric foam materials are very commonly used for, for cushions, especially for high value products. Uh, and they can be uh, polystyrene, they can be polyethylene, they can be a urethane or a, a wide variety of others as well. Uh, we know that some of these materials will uh, uh, amplify vibration input higher than others. In other words, they're not as well damped. Uh, when you compress a, a polyurethane cushion, which is open cell, you have to squeeze the air out of it. That's what, that's what happens. Uh, most polyurethane cushions, for example, you know, the, if you're sitting on a cushion chair, the chances are pretty good you're si sitting on polyurethane. And so it's an open cell. You can hear the air rush out as you sit on the cushion. Now this, that tends to create damping in the system that is very beneficial uh, because it keeps the amplitudes fairly low. So even if even if you do happen to encounter a, a compound resonance situation where the product and, uh, and package system coincide in their resonances, if it's a well damped cushion, you don't have a high amplification level and, and you're much better off. So if you had your choice, you'd rather have high damping. Um, a very popular cushion material that most people would recognize is a polyethylene foam. Uh, Ethafoam is the most famous brand name of that particular group, but there's a variety of others as well. It, this happens to be a closed cell material, so it's like a whole bunch of balloons that are glued together, if you will. Well, if you ever, you know, jumped on a balloon or an exercise ball, you know that you, you bounce quite a bit on the darn things. In other words, they're poorly damped. They don't. They don't uh, stop the vibration input. So uh, closed cell cushion materials tend to be uh, less desirable because they are not as well damped as uh, others are. Some of the materials, the uh, polystyrene is a good example, are somewhere in between because they're, they're a more rigid structure. Um, so don't think that the damping in, the, in cushions is something that you need to design for necessarily. You should certainly be aware of it, uh, but actually designing for it is, is, uh, is probably pretty tough. Um, another uh, topic of conversation that uh, showed up this morning um, in this morning's webinar was uh, the combination of temperature and vibration. And in particular, uh, the individual wanted to know Okay, what effect does temperature have on the vibration characteristics? And it's a very good question. In general, as things heat up, they get softer. Um, and as they, uh, <laughs> that comes as no surprise to anyone, I hope. Um, but if you take uh, the structure of a product, for example, if it's uh, comprised of some uh, metallic material, aluminum, steel, or anything like that, as it heats up, it will, in fact, um, get less stiff. And therefore, the K value, the, the spring constant, will decrease, okay, and, and therefore the natural frequency will decrease. That's uh, simply how things work. Uh, most cushions work exactly the same way. If they're excited either, uh, I'm sorry, if they're heated either by uh, ambient temperature around them or by uh, you know, excessive working, fatigue, for example, they will heat up, and as a result, 
their spring constant will decrease and the natural frequency will decrease. So these are not uh, static things. They, they do move around depending on temperature, which is why, uh, or, or another good reason for considering a combined environments type of test. And I suspect if we were having a discussion like this in 10 years, that that would be a standard test procedure. It wouldn't surprise me a bit. Um, so temperature and, and uh, vibration are closely related. Uh, I also mentioned this morning that there, there was a, a product being tested in our laboratory several weeks ago, and I, it happened to be supported on what's referred to as wire ropes, which are simply uh, heavy-duty cables looped uh, around, and uh, one portion of the product is on the loop, and the other uh, portion is fastened to the base of the, of the crate. And uh, so as this uh, product package system is subjected to vibration input, these uh, coils will uh, compress somewhat in order to absorb the vibration. It's actually a rather ingenious uh, system that's used a lot in the, the military. You find uh, products, uh, those of you who have been through the Navy know that there's a lot of products on, on shipboard uh, that are uh, fastened to the floor, to the deck, uh, by means of these wire ropes. Well, as, as they compress, they get uh, more and more, uh, they will actually heat up, so it's probably uh, uh, a good idea to check those kind of systems with both temperature and vibration. So that's about the, uh, all of the uh, questions that uh, were asked this morning. I see there aren't any additional ones, so um, let's, uh, let's finish up. Okay, um, thanks for, for going over the questions from this morning. I found it informative and great, and I hope you all did. Uh, we got a few more things to wrap up here, so thanks for sticking with us the whole way through, guys, and we'll see you at the next webinar. Thank you, Greg. Um, I'd like to emphasize that this topic of dynamics will continue with a presentation of a shock test theory and practice uh, at a future uh, webinar. Uh, we hope the information presented today was useful to you and, and that you will join us uh, for the next webinar as well. Watch your emails for announcements uh, uh, when the next webinar will be held. So thank you very much for attending and have a great day.